Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. In 1742, the HMS Centurion, under the command of Admiral George Anson, anchored in Tinian. The story is intriguing, and this month it came to life in the Marianas when the descendant of Admiral Anson, George R. Anson, and his family retraced the Admiral's steps here to the Marianas. We had a chance to talk with George Anson, the eighth generation grandson of the Admiral. And here's what he and his son and wife had to say about their recent visit. It started as an idea probably more than two years ago, or maybe even 20 years ago, where you, as a young boy or whatever, you read these stories about how one of your ancestors 280 years ago sailed around the world. Mm-hmm. And not many people had done it that. And it was a great adversity and hardship, and he came out at the end of it, um, you know, being fated by the public then as one of the great heroes uh, of that time. So it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit of mythology, but it's also something that I thought would be great to do for my 60th birthday. So I, I'm 60 on June the 7th this year, <clears throat> and rather than just have, well, we may well have a party, but we thought to celebrate it and to memorialize it is to undertake a trip where we would make landfall in all the places where Commodore Anson made landfall as well. So what are your impressions of the Marianas? You've been here a few days. Well, I'll give you mine, and my wife and son can also tell you as well, but, um, <clears throat> you know, it, for us as European travelers, it's not on uh, the path, you know, for, for a lot of tourists and people visiting. So we weren't quite sure what to expect. And firstly, the climate, which is wonderful, is, is fantastic, particularly for us Northern Europeans where it's cold and rainy most of the time. Um, but also just the, the warmth and the generosity of the people here as well. We, made, we really have made to feel very welcome here. And then on top of that has been the, the history, <clears throat> the heritage of you know, the Shimora and the Carolina people, um, the colonialization of the islands or parts of it we didn't know anything about, which we've learned a lot about in the last few days. Um, and the way in which these things have been preserved and, and not forgotten. Um, you know, we, we, we've really enjoyed our time here. We've got another day and a half before we have to leave. But it'll certainly be one of the highlights of our trip. I understand you got to go to Tinian. What was that moment like for you? It's where the Centurion was anchored. Um, there was a small typhoon and its um, anchor cable snapped. It lost its anchors and was blown away from the island for 19 days. And now they just had a skeleton crew on board. The rest, including Commodore Anson, were on shore. And they thought they were shipwrecked. They really mm. thought they'd seen their only way of getting off the island disappear. And it sailed back miraculously with its skeleton crew 19 days later. Um, but it was great. We went out on the boat. We got to see pers- approximately where they anchored off there and the views which marry up from the sea with the drawings that were done by Percy Brett when they were at anchor in the, uh, in the harbor. What has it meant to you and your family to be taking this trip and to be here in the Marianas and, and see, especially for us, the impact that <clears throat> um, Commodore Anson had on the local community, documenting a lot of our history that wouldn't have been available to us today if he hadn't done that? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I appreciate that much of the, the um, local history here is oral, and so there isn't a lot of written history. I think it was a, you know, luck and a bit of um, <clears throat> good fortune that Anson came here and he documented not only where he stayed and what he saw, including the latte stones when they were, you know, up and standing, but also the flying proa. 
And so for us, it's been, I hadn't quite appreciated that there wasn't that much history here of those sort of um, his, historical artifacts for the local people. And so it's felt you know, like a coming home where sort of bringing back that, that knowledge and information that can be put to use here today. And for us, you know, it's, it's just like any family to be able to have that reconnection with your ancestors and the heritage of your family, it's, it's deeply satisfying. Has the story of uh, Commodore Ensign been a strong part of your family history, or is it something that you just took a personal interest in? <clears throat> well, so, my, my hashtag on Instagram is Admiral Ensign. <laughs> <laughs> and so I suppose it's become a family joke that I'm referred to as the Admiral, or at least in the Instagram world. Um, but look, I think um, I have my own little um, office study at home. I collect ants and memorabilia, and that's where it resides. But again, it's part of our family history and our heritage, and I think we should be proud of it. Absolutely. So looking to the future, anything you're taking from your experience here in the Marianas um, related to what might be coming up? future visit again or anything like that? <clears throat> well, I think there's probably, it's like our, you, you visit someplace for the first time and you feel like you're just scratching the surface. There must be more to see. So the only two islands we're seeing here are the CNMI, are Saipan and Tinian, and there are others. Um, I guess we're flying through Guam, but we're not seeing Guam. Um, and it just makes you wonder, maybe there's more to see, maybe there's more to experience. Certainly everything we've experienced so far has been fantastic. Just to echo what uh, my husband has said, that it's been, I mean, I, I'm a natural historian, so I'm always sort of curious wherever I go, and this has been so much richer and deeper in, in so many ways with, you know, the different peoples. And I suppose... You know, one thing I notice is just how inclusive and positive, you know, everybody is, given actually quite hard times, um, you know, since the last century. So, um, yeah, I, I will leave the island with a very warm and positive feel and, you know, would certainly be um, keen to visit again. Yeah, like this, obviously my dad is, he's eighth generation descendant from Commodore Anson. Um, I'm now ninth as his son. Um, I guess talking about returning to the island, I guess in time it would be great if I could potentially bring a tenth generation back here to, um, you know, and let them see the history and let the kind of uh, tradition continue, but also so they can also experience the um, amazing islands around here, the outstanding natural beauty and also the uh, amazing hospitality that we've um, been subject to whilst we've been here. It's going to be slightly sad to leave. Um, I think there's you know, more that we could do and things we'd like to do. And I think our closing thought would be is if we could, if there's a time in the future, near future, when we could come back, we'd probably do so without hesitation. That was our recent interview with George Art Anson, the eighth generation grandson of Admiral Anson, who anchored in Tinian in 1742. We'll be back with Admiral Anson's story after this break. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma'asi, Olomai, and thank you. Here now to give us the story of Admiral Anson is Jim Pruitt, archaeologist of the CNMI Historic Preservation Office. Way back in 2016, when I first started working at HBO, Scott Russell came to me and with an idea that he had known from historical accounts that Anson, Commodore Anson, had lost two anchors at Tinian. And he knew I was interested in underwater archaeology and maritime history and things like that. So he came to me with the idea of, those are probably still there. I bet we can find them. Um, in Anson's account, his travels around the world, there is a wonderful copper plate etching of HMS Centurion at Anchor in Tinian. 
And the idea of Scotty's at the time was that knowing where the ink, where the centurion was anchored, looking at that picture, knowing the depth that they anchored, we should be able to actually go out and find them relatively easily. How hard could it be? I knew that it would be very difficult, that it, once things are lost to the sea, they generally remain so. But I kind of kept that in mind. And lo and behold, about half a year later, Scripps Institute of Oceanography came out here to do a survey in Tinian Harbor. They were looking for World War II airplanes that crashed, but they had brought the equipment out to do a one mile by one mile, one square mile survey off Tinian Harbor. And they asked, what else should we expect? Is there anything that you're looking for? Is there anything that you know is there or might be there? And I said, actually, as a matter of fact, there might be these anchors, these two anchors that Centurion lost in 1742. Keep an eye out for them. And so they went out and did their survey, and lo and behold, a couple years, a couple years later, a couple days later, they sent an email with a picture of a side scan sonar image of an anchor and said, wow. we found this big anchor. Is this the one you're looking for? I said, yeah, that looks like it. Is there another one? I said, no, not so far. A couple days later, they sent another email with another image and said, hey, we found this other one. It looks like the first. I think these are the anchors you're looking for. Wow. And I sent those over to, to Scotty and of course, how hard could it be? Apparently, it wasn't that hard if you have the right people doing the right projects at the right time. So Scripps shared the coordinates with us. And in 2017, East Carolina University came out with a different grant. And as part of their activities, they were going to be going down to Tinian, and they graciously offered us Spot, a spot on their boat and a way to work in a dive on these coordinates to see what these anchors were. And we jumped on them, we f found the targets, and we said, yeah, these, these look like the anchors. And at that moment, what had started with a random discussion, hey, these are there, how hard can it be, became very real and turned into a project of can we do better recordings of them? Can we do more survey around the anchors? Should we do more survey around the harbor? Can we, can we identify these positively as Anson's anchors? And then where do we go from here? And so that became a project. We wrote a, a research design. We contacted the British Ministry of Defense. And thinking that we could turn this into a much larger project, but un unfortunately it, it has gone in leaps and starts and stops. We'll, there'll be a couple months of intense activity and we'll do a lot, and then it kind of goes to the back burner for a few months. Why did you contact the British Ministry of Defense? So because these came off a British warship, under a couple of different laws, they have... They, uh, under a couple different laws, they have claim or may have claim to them. And anyways, we thought it would be appropriate to notify them and to, to notify them that we found them and what we were doing, that we have this survey planned and to kind of get their blessing. And they wrote back and they did say that they claimed them, that they did belong to the British government still, but that we were free to do our survey as long as we didn't disturb them. And... That kind of went into, we had some more dives planned, we did some more survey, we took pictures, some sketches, some scale drawings, we took measurements, we searched around the anchors a little bit, and that's kind of as far as we got, and we're planning on more activities later in 2018 when Typhoon U2 came and put a damper on everything, even until now really, we're just getting to the point where we can think about trying to start talking about well, where do we go from here with this project. Is the thought to maybe um, get them out of the water? Or what's the ultimate goal here, you think? So that, that has been a question that's come up. And at this point, 
in time, there have been a few discussions. For me, at, at HPO, my first goal is to finish the survey that I wrote a plan for and haven't finished yet. There are still some research questions that I have specifically about the anchors themselves, the objects themselves, as well as the area around them. Um, we want to look at not just the one, you know, the five meters in which the anchor sits, but also some larger arcs around them. Are there other artifacts present? If there are, are they from this ship? Are they from some other ship? To maybe use this as a segue into a much broader survey in the future about Tinian Harbor, since it has been in use since there were prehistoric, since there were prehistoric Chamorros, since there were the indigenous people on Tinian, that harbor has been in use. Maybe this very specific study can springboard into a larger survey asking more questions about prehistoric use and historic use of Tinian Harbor. So for me, the next steps are to get back down to Tinian to do a few more dives to complete the documentation on the anchors and their immediate surroundings and write a report on it. And with that report in hand, that might be what we need to go back to the Ministry of Defense as well as to our own administration, to anybody who is interested and say, well, where do we go from here? Ultimately, the, the discussion at one point was, well, should we raise them? Should we conserve them? Should we display them? And that's kind of a loaded question. It would be great if we could, yes. That would be, uh, there is a great story to be told with Anson's voyage around the world and his legacy, how Tinian played into that, how the drawings that he did of the Flying Pro at Tinian, how those are still in use today in this effort to revitalize the indigenous navigation and boat building activities. So there were wide ranging impacts from his accidental stay on Tinian and that's a great story to be told, and the best way to tell a story is with a physical object, something that will bring people into the room to look at, rather than just a storyboard. Um, tell us, for those that may not be familiar, what we have in our history books about um, Anson and the Centurion here in the Marianas. So in the history textbook, there is a short section that essentially describes his, that Anson came here, they stayed on Tinian, and they left. And this was in the 1700s? Yes, this was in the mid-1700s. The voyage around the world was from 1740 to 1745 is when he finally returned. And there really weren't a lot of people going, circumnavigating the globe at that point. Yeah, there were, he wasn't the first. There were a handful of people, especially there were some Britons who had done it before him, but during his circumnavigation, they captured a Manila galleon, and they returned to England with a Manila galleon and all of its treasure, and that made him famous. Just They put all the treasure on carriages and rolled through the streets, and so Anson kind of became famous for this, and his account, the journals that he kept that were then turned into a story, into a story, into a book and published, became not required reading, but that became one of the accounts of, for British captains that they would read about crossing the Pacific and what they might find out there. And so many of the subsequent circumnavigations when English captains stopped at Tinian because Anson wrote about it, because he wrote how good the harbor was, how plentiful the fruits and food and water was on, on Tinian, because he wrote all of that, many people later stopped that perhaps wouldn't have gone to Tinian, who may have come to Saipan, or they may have gone somewhere else. But there was a written account that said it was a safe harbor and supplies could be had. So they, they did, they continued that through the late 1700s into the 1800s. So that, that started kind of people coming to Tinian um, in that era. It's, it's you kind of you kinda mentioned a little bit about what he detailed about his occurrence there. Could you expound on that? 
Yeah, so while he was there, they were there for 53 days trying to recover the sick, replenish the supplies, repair the ship. One of his officers, Percy Brett, was an artist. And so he made several very detailed drawings of House of Taga, of of Tinian from the anchorage, from the centurion's viewpoint. There's a view of Saipan as viewed from Tinian. So he's... They made several detailed drawings. One of the most important ones was they captured a flying proa. There was a team, a group of people who came up from Guam. There was a Spanish officer and several Chamorro men who came up to kill cattle and jerk the beef to bring back down to Guam. Um, Tinian was depopulated at this point after the Reduccion, so the cattle had gone free, but they were plentiful. So they were there. When Anson's ship came in, they immediately captured these people and their ships because these Spanish were enemies. That's why Anson was doing this whole voyage in the first place. But as part of that, they, Percy Brett drew a very technical ship's drawing of the Flying Proa and the method that a ship maker would draw it. If a ship maker wants to document a ship and the curves and how it is constructed, there's a, a certain way of doing that, and Percy Brett did that to a flying proa. So, and this drawing has survived to this day as the best example that we have of how these were built. There were verbal descriptions before, there were other drawings with varying degrees of accuracy, some that looked like a man in a boat with a sail, and a banana boat with a sail, essentially, but this is a very technical one that ship people with the ship making tradition, a Western ship making tradition, could interpret these drawings and reconstruct the boat if they wished. And that is what people here are doing now in these efforts to reinvigorate and revitalize the navigation and shipbuilding tradition. They're using these technical blueprints essentially that Anson's officer drew as a curiosity. So little did they know at that time how wide-ranging that impact would be. What does it mean? Well, I understand you made a presentation to uh, Mr. Anson and his family yesterday about uh, this historical part of his family's history. What does it mean for you personally to see this archaeological project that you, you started a few years ago now connect with an a, a person or something in modern day history that ties what you the work you do to the past to the future so closely. So a, a joke at at school for archaeologists that you usually hear is about kind of the social inability of archaeologists. They say, "Well, archaeologists become archaeologists; so they only have to deal with dead people." <laughs> and, <laughs> and and to an extent. That can be true, but it's very rare that a project that you work on, you get to tie directly to people who were originally involved in it. More so maybe in historic archaeology when we're talking about World War II, then maybe you can meet that person or their kids or grandkids, but it's, it's not often. So it's really nice to me to see a project that has been near and dear to my heart that I've put so much blood, sweat, and tears and you know, countless nights writing reports and researching anchors and shipbuilding and reading logs of whalers who've gone through Tinian since to, to go from the dry archaeological well, I have to write a report side of this to actually meeting the descendant who's interested in the anchors and the impacts that, you know, why, when Anson was here, what happened, it, it made it all very real, less abstract as, well, we're, we're studying this because it's there, or we're studying this because it's significant, but it also brought a personal touch to it. That's kind of rare. And so that was really nice to be able to talk to him and to see their interest in it. To them, it's not just another old anchor, like to many people out here, it's, oh, well, it's another old anchor. We have plenty of old anchors. They're, they have a specific interest in these anchors. And so that's, you know, that was a really nice personal touch to it. 
Well, we're, we're putting a lot of um, weight on these anchors, no pun intended. How sure are we at this point that they are from the centurion? And so that's the million dollar question. Um, they don't say HMS Centurion on them in a way that we can see now. If there were any markings on them, which there used to be, and there may, they may still be there, they are covered in a concretion, in a growth that has grown over them in the previous 277 years or so since they've been there. So anything that used to be marked on them, we can't see now where they lie at the bottom of the sea. That being said, the style of anchors changed through time, and that has been documented in various shipbuilding books and history books of at XYZ date, anchors were, began to be built in this fashion. Were they very long? Were they short? Did they have straight arms? Did they have curved arms? What were the ratios? Some things like that. And these anchors, these two anchors that we found, fit the style we would expect to see on Anson's ships. But more importantly, their size fits. They're massive. The large one is almost 16 and a half feet long. And the small one is 15 feet long. So they're, they're giant. They're enormous. Um, if anybody has ever seen the conception anchor outside of HPO's bunker down by the airport, that's 12 feet long. So we're talking four feet longer than that. So these are huge. And based on their size, we can then go back and determine how large of a ship would they have been assigned to. Big ships need big anchors. Small ships don't need so large anchors. And they fit the size of anchor that would have been on about a thousand ton ship, which is what Centurion was. Looking back through all of the records that we can find the historic records, there were not any other ships even close to that size that went through Tinian at that time. Um, some of Anson's officers went back to Tinian about 20 years later, 10, 20 years later, but they were in smaller ships, so they would have had smaller anchors. So the, the style and the size match exactly what we would expect to see from Anson's ships. And the location. We, we took a picture from where the middle of the anchor is about where the ship would be. We took a picture and compared that to the drawing that Piercy Brett did of Centurion at anchor, and the landforms match. You can see the different hills and rises and plateaus of Tinian, and they look the same. So are we 100% sure? Not now, and maybe we never will be. But all of the evidence that is available to us points that these are Centurion's anchors. Um, but there's still more work to be done. There's still some more research to do. There are two different accounts of whalers who said that they recovered one of Anson's anchors um, in, the, in the early 1800s. There are two separate accounts that are both hearsay accounts that say that they recovered in weighing anchor at Tinian, they accidentally hooked an anchor and brought it up and found it was one of Centurion's, and they brought it down to Guam and turned it over to the governor who had it turned into belts and bars, I think. And so that's a loose end that needs to be tied up in some shape, form, or fashion. I don't believe that, that this was one of Anson's anchors that were recovered. I th because there, we only have a count of one large ship, Centurion, going through in that time period that lost anchors. So I find it very hard to believe that there was a third anchor out there of the same size and style. If one of Anson's anchors was recovered, then what are we looking at? What unknown thousand-ton ship using British-style anchors from the late 18th century was there? I find it more likely that this whaler in pulling up an anchor just assumed it was Anson's because that was the only story that was maybe popular at the time. And maybe they got somebody else's, a different whaler's anchor, one of the subsequent voyages, Anson's officers made voyages and they lost anchors in Tinian Harbor, so maybe that was one of them that was recovered. So that's a loose end to tie up, but I don't think it will ultimately prove that these are not Anson's anchors. As 
all of the evidence points towards, yes, these are. Thank you so much for your time today. Any closing thoughts? Um, I guess to answer your original question of long-term, what is our plan for these? I started talking about the story. One possible conclusion to this story that, that I know Scott Russell, when he was in the head of humanities, was really interested in, and I was in as well, is the possibility that we could get stakeholder support to raise and conserve these anchors and put them on display. I think that would be a great way to bring this story back to the people, to remind them, because the only thing of the original ship that is left is the rear foot of the figurehead, which is on display at Shugborough Estate, the Anson family estate in England. So having an, maybe an anchor to put on display at a museum in England and a, an anchor to put on display in Saipan or Tinian would be a great way of reinvigorating this story of how this one ship sailing around the world changed history for us locally in terms of the ships that came here. And Anson was a big figure. He changed the way the British Navy operated since then. Maybe these anchors are the, are the springboard that we use to tell that story. But that is, that is still ahead of us to be determined where do we go from here. But it's a very exciting possibility. And meeting the Anson family in person has made it seem even that much more important, that much more of a reality. It's kind of reinvigorated my interest in pulling this back off the back burner and take a look at it again maybe try to close out this survey, finish up a report, and then take the next steps. Today we've heard the story of Admiral Anson, the British admiral who anchored in Tinian in 1742. We also heard from his eighth-generation grandson and ninth-generation grandson during their recent visit to the Marianas. It's really been history come to life. We hope that you've enjoyed our show. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You can contact us on Facebook at 670Humanities. And if you'd like to hear more of the show, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Northern Marianas Humanities Council. This has been your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council.